Lecture twenty three. What Shiblon, or what, what、uh, Alma told Shiblon, and where I want, wish to begin my material today, fits in with what we just experienced. Now, let's, how many of you, any, any return missionaries in the class? Do I have any return missionaries? I have one, two, two, just two. Now, the others, you'll be returning from a mission someday, and when you do, I hope you will remember the 38th chapter of Alma, where a father who's president of the church. Counsels a son who's just off a mission. You know, we lose about half of our missionaries when they come home. We lose them. We pick them up as prospective 70s and high priests further down the trail,、um, or、um, prospective activated elders. But about half of them let go of the iron rod after they come back. Now, it doesn't mean they become bad people, they just get out of the routine of helping the Lord do His work. Almost as though they've done their stint. Or their duty, like they had in the army, and now get on with life. And, and when they do that, they do exactly what Almas told Shiblin would happen. Now, Shiblin had been very violent. He's been a great missionary. He endured bonds. He was stoned. His father said, You've been a source of much joy to me, my boy, and you'll be a source of more joy in the future. And、uh, he said, Now, I want to give you some advice. Now, when you come back off of a mission, there are several things that Are very important to keep in mind. And、uh, they're listed in verses 10 to 12 of this chapter, which is all I will comment. The rest of this chapter is very plain.、Uh, the first thing, he told Shiblon to remain active. All right, he said, You've been out there every day from early in the morning, late at night. You've been doing your work and preaching to the people. Now, don't stop that. Sure, you've got other things to do, but keep the、uh, fire of the gospel burning. Keep studying. Keep writing, keep teaching, keep speaking, keep preaching, keep looking for converts. That's the first thing. Remain active. The second thing was to be diligent but temperate. Now, don't know how to describe that, except that as you make the, the tr transition from dedicated gospel service in the mission field over to routine civilian life, it's possible to become intemperate in your anxiety. Almost as though you felt like you were a little bit behind the times,、so、you've got to make up for it. And you get in there, and the first thing you know, you say to your, your roommate, Gosh, I've got to study on Sunday. In fact, I don't even have time to go to church. I've got to maintain these scholarship grades. Now, that's what most of my peers did when I was going to law school, who were Latter day Saints. And it all fell out of the kingdom because they couldn't afford to go to church. And I was working 12 hours a day to 14 hours a day in the FBI. And going to school for two hours at night, law school, having to study two hours besides that. So I said to my wife,、uh, we were making $120 a month. I said,、uh, Honey, would you mind、uh, helping out just a little bit financially here so I can stay active in the church? And she said, Well,、uh, I, I wanted to do that. I was a little fearful to suggest it. But she said, If you don't mind, she said, I'd like to do that. And I said, Then I can drop my scholarship. Because to get a scholarship, you have to go that extra 15 to 20 percent of the way and write articles of the law review, and those are the things that were, my buddies were all doing, and it was taking them out of the church. And if I hadn't been working in the FBI overtime, I could have done it.、Uh, but under those circumstances, I, I said, I think if we can do it for a year or two, I can come out of it, and I'll begin getting little increases at work, and it'll, it'll come out all right. And、uh, so she went to work at Woodward and Lothrop's as a clerk. I dropped from an A to a B. And、uh, taught a Sunday school class that ultimately reached 350 at the Washington Chapel in Washington, D.C.,、uh, from which we were able to baptize between five and six people a month. Over 50 investigators attended that class. Why,、well, that was one of the most thrilling things that ever happened to me. Then I was made state mission president, went on, had some other wonderful experiences. You see, the Lord's got blessings for you if you'll just stay where He can give them to you. And we actually had to maneuver our life and readjust our life in a way where I could stay active in the kingdom and still、uh, keep creditable grades. I knew as much law as the other fellows. I just didn't have time to write those articles, etc. And when it was all over with, and we meet today,、uh, I think of those decisions that these fellow return missionaries made back at law school as they stand there smoking a cigar and talking to me and asking me how I'm, I'm doing and so forth. And I say, fine. How are you doing? Yeah, so so. And how's,、uh, how's Jeannie? Well, you knew her, we divorced. No, I didn't know that. 
How are your children? Oh, all right. They go on, go on their missions? Well, well no, 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 no. And the conversations get kind of thin, you know. We're miles apart. And it was made, that decision was made on a Sunday morning when a man said, I gotta get my law review article and not go to church. So, be diligent, but temperate. Keep things in balance. Don't go out of focus. Now three, in becoming educated, beware of pride in your own wisdom and arrogance in your own opinions. This is, all, this is also chapter, but I say this is chapter 11. You see, when you come off your mission, you've got several things to do. You've got to get your schooling finished, you've got to become economically independent, and you've got to find a wife. And Shibron is told about these three areas without mentioning them specifically. You notice those two verses relate to the average return missionary. Finest advice a father could give a return missionary. So he says, now don't be proud. Uh, you go to school and you learn a few cliches in the laboratory or in a philosophy class or something. You go home and, and you say, Dad, um, um, are we um, dualists or monoists, would you say? His father says, son, eat your soup. <laughs> Well, actually, we're neither monos or dualists. Latter-day Saints know that we are, we believe in a tri-dimensional reality. Okay? So that's what you need to tell your father. You tell him, well, I'm sure glad we're not monos or dualists, that we believe in a tri-dimensional reality. Now, if you say to your father, uh, Dad, uh, the realities are an intelligence in a spirit in a body. It's sort of a, a trinity, isn't it? Yes, my son, it is. You'd call it a tridimensional reality, philosophical terms. He doesn't know what you're talking about. And he knows all about what you're talking about if you use the right words. But some young people will use sophisticated language and so forth. Uh, it, 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 they enjoy seeing their folks go into shock. And this, this just creates a generation gap as the parents feel like they've lost their children who've risen above them. And they very humbly listen to them and, and watch them. And you get everything up, upside down here. So he says... Um, in becoming a learned, uh, beware of pride in your own wisdom and arrogance in your own opinions. Now, um, I have a very well-educated man as my state president, under whom I serve in the High Council. Uh, he's the president of one of the large corporations in Salt Lake, the Beaner Block Company. Now, if I introduced you to Clarence Beaner, he, he's all smiles, and I'm going to care in the world, and everything's fine, and I wasn't all about you, and all about your relatives, and where you're from, and, and he's just so full of life, and loves people, and, and you've got a suggestion for him, he'll listen, just so intent. There's nothing arrogant, or smug, or even self-sufficient about him. He's that way with his employees. If somebody's going to have a baby or something, he's just as concerned as though he's the grandfather or something. And... Um, there's a spirit of affection and confidence that grows up around that kind of a man. That's the kind of people we want to develop. Because we've, we've found that, and that's the fourth point that, Shib that uh, was made to Shibron, as you become economically independent, be bold, but don't become overbearing. Don't become arrogant and overbearing out there. You get out in the competition of the world and start making a living for yourself. And brother, a lot of people climb over dead bodies and on the necks of other people. And don't let yourself be snared, because crime does pay. And so does rudeness and crudeness and character assassination. It definitely pays on a ladder of success until you get up there and collapse and fall on your face. Because that always happens, eventually. Eventually. So he's saying to him, uh, be bold. You've got to get out there and pitch. You just can't stand back there and say, I hope somebody offers me a job. Wouldn't that be nice? Somebody call me on the phone and throw out a job? It's really Christmas. I wish I would get a job. <laughs> now you get out there and hit the pavement, knock on doors, anything, nothing today. It's okay. I'm coming back. You wouldn't mind if I drop back, would you? No, but there won't be anything. It's all right. I'll be back. And you are. And he says to himself, boy, when I do have an opening, I hope he's around. That's the kind of boy I went out that front office. So that's how you're making your impression. Be bold. Go out there. Let your talents be known. But when you get into position, don't be dominant, overbearing. I know the first, uh, the first uh, shift that I had charge of in the FBI, I had charge of the night shift, midnight shift, and the evening shift on a combination basis. And, and the day shift administrator 
would stand there and talk so roughly to his people uh, that as I would come on, they'd be in my office, uh, so they'd go out by themselves, and full-grown men just bawling with anger. Tears just rolling down their faces, they're so angry. So one day I said to this other supervisor, I said, do you enjoy making people hate you? He said, that's the way to make them work. Mr. Hoover wants them to work, that's the way I make them work. I said, actually, uh, they aren't working nearly as well for you as they are for some other people I know. And all we're doing is generating hate. I said, if you just stop and think about it, you got some breaks by some people who kind of patted you on the back and helped you up. And I know who they are, and you know who they are. And I said, you and I are on a par, and I'm talking to you now as a friend. See, so you can't let, get these people to like you and work for you because they love you instead of hate you. So I said, that's soft approach. I've seen that. Well, I've been in the construction business. You want anything out of a man, you grind it out of him. That's all they get it. I said, I don't think they ground it out of you, and you worked hard. Well, I'm different. I'm a self-starter. They're not. You, know, you grind it out of them, you don't get it. I said, well, uh, this thing will blow. They're going to go to Mr. Hoover one of these days, and it'll all be over. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, overbearing. Now, he wasn't a return missionary, by any means. Uh, but, the, but this is what uh, he's telling the ship on. Don't be overbearing. Now, he said, in seeking a companion in marriage, bridle your passions. I want to say just a, th a word or two about this because there's something very unique about the discipline that we put our young people through. We start out very early in their life when the emotions are just beginning to build in the, in the body, and these are built-in defensive devices. Uh, they are, they're completely computerized. Uh, they have no reference to morality. Uh, all they demand is attention and uh, satisfaction. They're built into the human being, just as they're built into everything else that survives. And they're put there by our Heavenly Father. All other creatures have theirs uh, within a certain degree of sublimation. Human beings do not. We have the intelligence to sublimate them, but without that intelligence, uh, human beings are much more um, terrible and vicious than than, than uh, lower types of life. And so our Heavenly Father holds us responsible to keep these things under control. When our young people are coming up, our boys are coming up, we, we keep preaching it and teaching it, keep everything within proper limits. Uh, we want our boys and girls to feel a wholesome attraction to each other. All oh, that's fine. We want to have them homogenized and mixing together and uh, dancing and socializing and dramatizing, etc. But always with a temple between them. To get together, they must go through the temple. We always keep the temple between them. We call it a temple courtship. Now, when a boy is um, 18, 19, falls in love with a girl, um, sometimes you'll wonder why um, he, he's such a reluctant uh, person. He never makes any commitments. I mean, he, she, knows he, he, she knows he loves her. But none of this, uh, we're going to get married. Uh, none of that talk, you know. None of this commitment. Uh, want to talk about home, family, and something permanent, but he never says anything. Well, all the girls need to know that as our boys are growing up and as they approach the mission, they're almost conditioned to be very careful about, a, about breaking a heart uh, by making it premature commitments. Because they've got that mission of two years, might be a stint in the army afterwards, they just don't know. It's a very insecure time, and so very few of them, a few get engaged, but a few uh, even when they love a girl desperately, will we'll sort of be restrained. Now some go ahead and, and um, get engaged and hope it will work out, and usually does for at least three or four months, and uh, then a dear John letter comes along. But sometimes the girl will wait, uh, as uh, uh, two of our girls, two girls have waited for two of our boys, and it's just been a beautiful thing to watch, the, uh, watch it work out and how f wonderful they were. And, uh, but a girl runs quite a bit of risk on that that she needs to recognize because sometimes the boy comes back and he's different. I mean, a boy may go and he's a guitar strumming gung-ho, you know, downbeat boy. When he goes, go on a mission, oh yeah, I'm going on a mission, <laughs> and so forth. Um, and when he gets out in the field and settles down and finds himself, he comes back a classical pianist, you know. And... Uh, like one of our sons, he went uh, kind of harem scare when he left. He, he's now uh, getting his doctorate in nuclear physics. 
I mean, a girl that would have married him at 19 would have been in trouble uh, now that he's 24 or so. I mean, I mean, if that's the kind of boy she wanted. And there was a girl who thought she wanted him, and, and uh, they were so much in love, they were going to get, let the mission go, and so forth. Uh, but uh, a little counsel and so forth, and they decided that wasn't a good idea, and she said, well, we'll prove our love. We'll just test it. And you go on your mission, and we'll just test it. So they did, and she was married three months later. And that was that. And, um, but that was a good test, you see. Anyway, they come back. Now when a boy comes home, uh, he, his mind is full of what he's got to do. He couldn't support anything now to save his soul. And uh, he hasn't anything to offer a girl except hopes. But lots of girls, that's all they want. They can work it out with somebody that's got hopes. Uh, but uh, he doesn't know that. And so um, he's got to finish his education, and he's got that army situation, he's got to work that out too, and he's got to get his education, he's got to become economically independent, and then find a wife all, all three at once. So something happens to him if, the, if he has the slightest inclination that he might be able to make it and promise something to a girl, usually he'll go forward. In fact, his missionary president told him, you know, get home, marriage, go, 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 go. <laughs> Uh, so he, he comes home pretty motivated. Now, if he becomes available, it, this is his attitude. All of a sudden, his attitude changes. Before, he wasn't available. And, and the girls would notice there's a certain restraint, uh, uh, affectionate, loves to go places and that sort of thing. But when it comes right down to, you know, talking about serious things and companionship forever, he just wasn't talking it. Now he's ready to talk it. Looking around. And... Um, uh, it's a, you have to be careful because it's a time when one might be a little overzealous. And um, the psychology there is um, ready, 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 you know? Now, Alma says to Shibla, now at this stage now, now you bridle your emotions because you've got, you had restraints before you don't have now. You're ready, to, you're ready now. But don't take too much for granted here. You bridle your emotions as you move forward here to find this sweetheart and companion. And the girls need to understand this transition through which the boys under the discipline of the priesthood go. Because if they'll just keep their wits about them, as the Alma was trying to get Shubon to do, they just come out fine. But they can let go of the iron rod and, and do some very foolish things if they're not careful. And our girls need to help them kind of come through this tide. I notice some of the girls now wearing wishing rings, not engagement rings, but wishing rings. That's kind of cute. And, uh, and, and that's a nice way to test it. You know, we wish it works out, we hope it works out. But a girl you see at 19, uh, you've got the girl now that you're going to marry. But a boy at 19, you haven't got the boy you're going to marry, or the person you're going to marry. A girl doesn't have him yet. He hasn't even got himself yet. The concrete won't set up for another two years. And um, when he's 21, you're pretty sure he actually isn't grown up until he's 24. But at 21, he's often a much different person. He can be wild and radical at 19 and tremendously conservative at 21. Uh, or he can be a very, a, a very sober, uh, uh, pious type of person at 19 and wild at 21. So you gotta kind of let the maturation process go through. Now, I, I saw in a book day before yesterday, a sociology book where it said, uh, it says um, <clears throat> the male is the aggressor, is aggressive. The female is passive. Uh, this actually is the relationship. Of course, this, this just isn't so. It's ridiculous. Um, actually, the, the, the boy is, um, uh, play, uh, plays the role of, of wanting to give, to share. There's initiative there. He takes the initiative. Um, and this is sort of the way it seems that our Heavenly Father pointed up. And in the female personality, there's the anxiety to receive, to, uh, to be made a queen, and to be made uh, over, and to have, a, have a, a place of real distinction in the life of somebody. To be wanted and to be loved is the greatest motivation in the female personality. Now, this is not the greatest motivation in the male personality, and the girls should know this. A boy wants to be loved, but he must be respected for something. That goes with his leadership initiative. He has to be respected for it. A lot of wives don't know that. They'll try to make over a boy and in the process criticize him all the time. And they wonder why he wants to go off every Saturday night every chance he gets to play golf, for which he's well known, or play poker even, for which he's pretty good, or something else crazy. 
And he doesn't know why often either. But he has to go sometime, someplace where he is respected for something. The male personality, it's not um, chauvinism. It's built right into him to want to do well in the world's work. And a girl can just love him to pieces. And if she doesn't respect him for something, and let him know that she respects him and is happy and proud that he can do at least something extremely well, he'll go somewhere just instinctively. He'll wander off somewhere looking for somebody who respects him for doing something worthwhile. And, and when I used to counsel young married or, or people who were having difficulty with their marriages, I would find that very often it had snuck up on them. For example, here's a wife, she kind of takes her husband for granted and so forth, and, and she nags him a little bit, but not too much and so forth, and kind of goes on day in and day out. Uh, he tries to tell her about his cases at, uh, I, I'm thinking of an attorney in Salt Lake one time, uh, a tragic divorce, completely unnecessary. And she's not interested in law cases. She says, oh, no, 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 Joe, don't, don't bring your work home now. Let's just have fun together. Let's, let's have, see, good TV tonight, or let's go out dancing. So one day he has a secretary, and she's a very uh, ordinary-looking person. And, uh, and she said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, I thought the way you presented that in court today was the best I've ever heard a plea on that point ever made by anybody. I was just proud of you the way you did that. He said, you were? He said, well, I wasn't sure I did a good job. She said, you did do a good job. And I don't care whether you win this case or not. That was a classical presentation. He said, well, analyze it for me. What was there about it you thought was impressive? And so she did. She thought, that was good, that was good, that was good. She wasn't, he could tell, she wasn't just uh, simonizing. She really was impressed. She'd been a legal secretary a long time, a couple of years older than he was, as a matter of fact. So he said, well, let's go to lunch and, and talk about it. He said, I got another presentation I'm worried about. So they go to lunch, they talk it over, see what happened. First thing you know, he enjoys being with her much more than his wife. And in a, a friendship it grew into uh, something else, and the next thing we knew we had a problem. And, and we sit down to counsel, and the wife says, I've given him the best years of my life. And he says, I know, and you've been a wonderful wife, but you aren't in love anymore. And I thought to myself, somewhere in our relationship between our young people, a boy needs to know that a girl needs to be loved. She is very important. It is very important to her to know that she's wanted and needed and loved. And she needs to know that he needs to be loved, but he also needs to be respected for something. He does well. And she needs to build that in him. And it isn't egotism. It isn't male chauvinism. It's the thing that makes him a man, makes him a Viking, makes him a general, makes him a good father. And she can build that in him, if you will. And he'll then get self-confidence. He goes out and gets jobs. He gets raises. He does better and better. And uh, they say, gee, he's a great guy. Well, she has told him where he's great. That's what, that's what helped him find himself. And she's a great woman because he tells her frequently she's a great woman and he loves her. That's so important to her. Now this actually is the male and female role. And boys need to understand it, girls need to understand it, and if we understand each other, we can really build happiness. But nagging will kill love, either by a man to a woman who says, well, I'm not adequate, you see, always then. Don't do this right. Don't cook like mother. All this stuff. That kills love. Or she can say, you're just a big uncouth bear. That's all you are. <laughs> no refinement in you. You don't like good music, etc., 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 etc. Some things she'll have to look over entirely. But he has some good points, and she'll build them. She'll make a great husband out of it. Well, all that Alma was trying to do is to make Shiblon a success in married life. I want to say just this one thing to the fellows, because they, 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 and the girls probably should know this too. A boy is no more aggressive and anxious to possess a sweetheart that he loves than a girl becomes anxious to be possessed. It isn't a question of, of, of aggression by a boy and passiveness by a girl. And a girl can become extremely aggressive, and a boy is not prepared for this because he expects a girl to be wooed and won um, and that it's a reluctant uh, situation. I mean, psychologically, that's what he's expecting. But every once in a while, a boy runs into a girl who loves him so much, 
and whose background is such that she doesn't have any restrictions. That, and she's so anxious to be possessed and to be received, she throws herself at him. And it's accompanied by situations and circumstances which she creates which are tremendously tempting. And every boy needs to know what to do if that happens to him. He owes it to that girl to bring her back to reality real fast and not to fool around and try to accommodate to it. Because uh, Joseph had the answer. Move out. Because you, she's in a state of mind where she's not rational. And you happen to be the person for which she's lost all reason and sense and would give up the whole celestial kingdom just for a moment of bliss with this particular individual. And so therefore asks him, actually asks him to be with her. A boy needs to be prepared for that, know what to do. And because I was raised on construction camps, my father told me what to do because he said he knew it would happen. He told me about a lot of the things that would happen to me also, and they did happen. One of them two weeks after he warned me that it might happen. And it was just real good that I had that kind of uh, counsel because I would have been curious maybe and just uh, stayed around to see what's next. Uh, that was interesting, not right, but wrong. <laughs> interesting, see what happens next here. <clears throat> That's not what you do, <clears throat> you move on out. So. Because these things exist, and the girl also needs to know, what will she do if she gets with a boy who loses his head and is extremely aggressive? She needs to think that one through. And sometimes it can happen to real nice people, people who are otherwise real nice folks. These emotions in us are just terribly powerful. And uh, so he says to Shiblon, see Shiblon, there's no problem with him. This isn't Corianton, this is Shiblon. Successful missionary. All right, now he said, now when you go out with those girls, <clears throat> and you get ready for marriage, you keep your emotions on a bridle. But you're going to express affection to them. And you're going to exchange a kiss and an embrace. And you dr exchange dreams together and plans together. <clears throat> and talk about family together. You keep your emotions on a bridle. There are only th three verses there, but they're just great. How much should be? <clears throat> then he gets over to Corian. That was a that was a tough assignment for a father. <clears throat> a lot of things came out in this conversation with Corian, which are significant. He starts out on the seriousness of immorality, and he says, "I have a lot more to say to you than I did to Shiblon, Corian, uh, because um, you really did betray me in the field. I don't know how many Solomite souls we lost who wouldn't believe in me because." of the rather ridiculous things that you did. But anyway, he said it in a way that Coriant knew he still loved him. Now he said, I'm going to give you some instructions. And I command you to do this, and I command you to do that. And I want you to repent. Now he didn't tell him to just stop being immoral. He said, now you get back in the field. Now you stay active in the kingdom. And you get in there and make up to God what you've done to him. I want you to work with all your heart, might, mind, and strength now. And I want you to try and make up for the damage you've done. I want to ask you something. What would have happened to Coriander if he had repented of fornication but felt so guilty that he never went back to church anymore? He remained a member of the church, was next communicated, actually repented, but felt too guilty to go to church. What kingdom does he inherit with those circumstances? What would you guess? Why terrestrial? Who goes to the terrestrial? Yes. They are honorable men of the earth who reject the gospel the first time around and pick it up on the second time. Or they are members of the church who accept the gospel the first time around and then don't re re uh, respond to the call to service. They are not valiant. Wh where would Corian have gone then? He didn't fight the church, did he? That would have been Telesto. He would have just been unvalid. But what did he do? Did he come back? Did he do like his father done, just spent every day and hour with all the energy he had trying to build up the kingdom? How do you think he ultimately ended up? Do you think he made it? As far as we can tell, he did. We hope he did. But boy, what a travail. What a heartbreak to carry around with him. The girl that he married, you see, has to accept the scars that go with what happened. And she has to do it with her eyes wide open. He has to pay for it that way, and so does she. So um, just something to keep in mind that when we do fall, that's not the end. We've, we've lost a great blessing, and we're going to have scars with us for a while. 
But the beauty of the atonement is we can make it, but brother, the hill is a lot steeper and rougher. And the risk of not making it is much greater. We've created tremendous handicaps for us. Now, he goes over then to talk to Corianton about the restitution uh, and what happens, rather, what happens when we die. <clears throat> now, I want you to remember this for examination purposes. That when we die, we go to the spirit world, and um, where is that? Where is that? On the sun? Long ways away? Where is the spirit's earth? I mean, the earth's spirit. Where's the earth's spirit? Yeah, right here. It's just beyond your fingertips. It's just another dimension. It's just right out there. And as you leave your body, you'll stand there and look at it, just like some of the brethren have, before they repossessed it again. And so when Brigham Young went over into the spirit world, looked around, and was allowed to come back, he had several things to say about the spirit world. He couldn't tell us much, except that once you've been there, it's almost a temptation to want to shorten life in order to return. And number two, he found that uh, the wicked and the good are all mingled together, and yet the scriptures talks about the wicked going into a prison over there. And what are they imprisoned in? Their own, their own bitterness, their own guilt, and there are places where they cannot go because of what they did. Now, he says that the angel told him that the moment that you cross the veil, you are in the presence of God. You can't see him, but you're in his presence, and his servants immediately judge you. And they, so they say, Brother uh, X, now let's see, you were a baptized member, weren't you? Oh, yes, I was baptized. And confirmed. Oh, yes, yes, I was confirmed. And you went on a mission. Yes, yes, I went on a mission. And, and um, you went to the temple. And yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and you held these offices. Yes, well, it's all on the record. I... I suppose everything's in good order. We, um, that was kind of a tough uh, graduation exercise you had, but at least you're here now, and everything's going to be just fine. And uh, some of that suffering helps us be sympathetic with other people, and you'll soon forget all of that. Meanwhile, your relatives are out here waiting to see you, and just then somebody else steps up. Now, Alma talks about this, and so does Nephi. He talks about the captivity of the devil. And a member of the priesthood of Lucifer says... Uh, to this man, Mr. X, uh, did you tell these authorities here uh, about that embezzlement deal? Who are you? I'm your guardian angel. I'm the one you've been listening to for 40 years. No, I, I didn't tell them about it. But why don't you tell them? Tell them about the $150,000 embezzled from the bank over a period of 30 years. Are you talking about that girlfriend on the side? No. Why are you talking about it? The fellow was silent. This guardian angel is from Lucifer. The guardian angel from Lucifer is the man. This, this man's been listening to him. He had a guardian angel for the Lord, but this fellow attached to him because he listened to him. So he says to the brethren, uh, I'm sorry, he's mine. He's been listening to me all his life, practically. Take him off. Now that's the first judgment. And Lucifer comes up and brings a railing accusation against us for everything he can. And we're all going to have some weaknesses there. And the brethren are in a position who are presiding there at that time. They are not allowed to <clears throat> admit us into the precincts where we really would like to go in, in direct companionship with those we love and want to be with. If they have a claim on us, a real substantial claim on us, it's got to be substantial, but if they have a substantial claim on us, uh, we have to wait a while. And we ought to know that, that that's the way it's going to be. Now that's the first judgment. The second judgment comes at the beginning of the millennium, when we're all gathered together, whether we're resurrected or not. Everybody who ever lived upon the earth from Adam on down is in a great huge conference described in the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. And we see the whole history of the world, a thousand years at a time, as God viewed it. We see every person. We can see what he thinks. We see his own personal life so that we know him as he knows himself. You've heard the phrase, seen as you are seen and known as you are known? That happens to the whole human race, as though we'd all lived the same life. We have no secrets. That's quite a judgment. I think we'll all just sort of gravitate to whoever we feel comfortable with. It won't be hard to judge anybody at all. Uh, but there'll be times when, when your life isn't shown, nothing up there on the screen at all. Your friends will say, hey, where were you? Oh, I'll be back. See, blackout. Blotted right out of the books, not even in the computer. 
The Lord forgave you entirely. You sit there sweating, if spirits sweat, and uh, watch the screen. Ooh, that was so nice of the Lord. I tried to repent, but that was such a stupid thing. It was so stupid. Boy, I put everything in jeopardy. That's the way it'll be. That's the second judgment. Now, the great last judgment comes at the end of the millennium. And that's when uh, we are rewarded according to our works completely seen by John the Revelator. And uh, the glories are assigned if they haven't been previously assigned. Now, many of them are previously assigned. But if they haven't been signed before then, they are. <clears throat> now, he says to Corinth, and he said, uh, I know you want to understand something about the resurrection and the restitution. And he says, uh, uh, there actually is a restitution of your original body. And, uh, now, this seems impractical and irrational. Joseph Smith said, here's what happens. The intelligence in the body that came under you will respond to your call on the morning of the resurrection. And it will never become the permanent part of anything else, grass or animal life or anything else. Once it's under you, you are its master intelligence. And on the morning of the resurrection, when that ordinance is performed in your behalf, all the essential parts of your body will return to you and answer to your call. But if they were rebellious at the time you laid them down, they will be rebellious when you pick them up. You still have to subdue them. And if you've pampered your body, taken in drugs, uh, been an addict to certain things, uh, they come back to you in a state of rebellion. Now, they're restored to you, but they're restored in the state of attitude that they had when they left you. Now, if somebody asks you where I got this doctrine, I put a few quotes in here so you'll see uh, where it is. Uh, Brigham Young and those brethren used to know this doctrine so well, they referred to it all the time, intelligence and matter, that you can control and command by the power of the priesthood. And that, that body, as Brigham Young said, the intelligences in Jesus' body wouldn't have thought of becoming part of any other body. It's the same as of your intelligences. Now, when you preach that doctrine, if you teach it to anybody, don't quote Brother Skousen. I'm only a reporter. I'm telling you what the brethren have taught. And it's line upon line and precept upon precept. And if you quote the original authority, you'll get no argument. But you quote a member of the College of Religion, and you're bound to get an argument. Because we weren't there. I've never been in the spirit world. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed some of the blessings of it, but I've never actually gone across the veil like, like President Young did. Now, quote the people who've been there. And Alma had an angel come from across the veil to tell him his part about it. Quote your Book of Mormon. That's why I'm trying to give it to you in depth. So you, when you get to the atonement and the fact that God could cease to be God, you would never quote Brother Skousen because nobody told that to Brother Skousen. No angel appeared and told me. I read it from Alma. And that's your source. And it's creditable. People will believe that. Don't quote your reporter. I just call it to your attention. Right? Well, all we know is, there are a lot of details we don't know. But supposing you were deformed, for example, and didn't have a, a hand. Actually, the intelligences were there to form one, but the material, the matter part, got a little confused in the genetic machine, and um, um, the, it got a little bit twisted around. But your body is returned to you perfect. It has none of the catabolical impact on it. The wrinkles, etc., no. Did you notice that passage? It's returned unto you perfect. It's restored unto you perfect. I mean perfect in form. But if they weren't subordinate to you and they're still a little rebellious when you laid them down, you still got to overcome them. 